Fred met Carolyn during his first year at university. As soon as he started medical school and encountered Carolyn, he was constantly amazed by her beauty. Fred had never had many girlfriends, but he couldn't be called a shy guy. Even before starting medical school, he had a girlfriend, his classmate Rose. Fred didn't immediately enroll in medical school. First, he decided to serve in the army to not worry about anything afterward. Unlike his cousin, who feared every knock on the door, I won't go to the army. You can torture me, but I don't want to go, his brother constantly said, having heard stories from his friends about the harsh treatment in the army. I'm afraid to go there, but Fred didn't want to hide, so he decided it was better to serve in the army right away and then live his life calmly. Besides, Having a record of military service in medical documents wouldn't hurt his job prospects. Before leaving for service, after all the guests had left, Fred had intimacy with Rose for the first time. But Fred later realized he had made a mistake. He shouldn't have done it, as he then thought she might not wait for him to return from the army. And now he couldn't blame her. Rose was a young, free, available girl whose boyfriend was serving in the army. Why wouldn't she take advantage of the situation? So, she did. After his service, Fred returned home, and Rose, already pregnant, was about to marry another guy. But Fred wasn't too upset since he had cheated on her while he was in the army with the daughter of a soldier. So the guy wished Rose good luck and left for the city to enroll in medical school. There, he submitted the necessary documents for admission to the university and, after being accepted, moved into the campus in medical school. He met Carolyn and couldn't help but admire her beauty, her slender figure, her long legs. Despite her long legs, the girl was of average height, and her hair was fiery red. It seemed that when she worked, there was a bonfire behind her, with sparks flying in all directions. Fred had never seen such a red hair color before. And the girl also had expressive green eyes, looking like a true Irish woman. Fred was completely sure that if he hadn't met her, he wouldn't be able to study at this university. So, he tried to study only to be close to her. And that's where his problem arose. If she weren't so beautiful, he would have approached her first and introduced himself. But he didn't know what to do. It even seemed that he began to doubt himself constantly paying attention to his appearance. Like his legs weren't crooked. Or were they? Although men are supposed to have crooked legs, what else should a man have? A scar on his face. And he didn't have any scar. And his face was somewhat ordinary. He never used to think about his appearance before. Rose said he was the cutest guy. So he believed her and never doubted it. And now he looks at himself in the mirror and wonders if he's handsome enough. For Rose, yes, for the daughter of a soldier too. But this girl is completely different. She might not even look at such a simple guy. And what if she rejects him? Of course, he won't lose faith in humanity. He just didn't want to lose his only chance. Because as long as he didn't approach her, he still had that one chance and hope. That's why Fred didn't rush to introduce himself to her. He learned that the girl's name was Carolyn and decided that was enough for now. What a beautiful name she had, Carolyn. The Lord really created such a wonderful girl. I wonder, for whom? The thought that Carolyn might end up with another guy instead of him made Fred angry. How could it not be for him? And for whom else? Even a small mole resembling a star on Carolyn's right cheek didn't spoil her appearance at all. On the contrary, it made her even more attractive. Previously, women deliberately glued moles to their faces to attract men's attention. Now Fred was sure that many girls draw moles on themselves. Only drawn moles really didn't look good. And he could immediately tell if a girl had a drawn mole on her face or a real one. Carolyn definitely had a real mole, and an unusual one at that. So he followed her until Christmas but was afraid to approach her. How long are you going to stare at me? She asked, unexpectedly approaching him from behind. At that moment, Fred stood by a column at the university party on Christmas night. Who? Me. 
I wasn't looking at you. Fred tried to justify himself. Come on. Do you really think nobody notices that I like you? She asked. It's obvious. Probably only a blind person wouldn't see it. And if he couldn't see it, he'd feel it. Carolyn said, laughing. Fred felt himself blush deeply. It's hot in here. Let's go outside. She said, squinting her green eyes, and confidently grabbed his hand, leading him along. Fred was delighted. It seemed like all the holidays were happening at once today. He had never experienced such a surge of emotions in his life. After all, Carolyn approached him herself and took his hand. He had never felt better. I liked you from the start. I kept waiting for you to come up and introduce yourself. You know how many guys I turned down while waiting for you. Maybe I turned them down for no reason. Are you always going to be this shy guy? Carolyn laughed. You see, I'm an Eastern woman. I like decisive guys. I came here to study from another city. Yeah, I'm, ah, uh, I'm a decisive guy. Fred wanted to say confidently, but he felt like he was speaking very hesitantly, like a first grader at the blackboard. Don't worry, I'm kidding. For my temperament, a calm guy like you is exactly what's needed to neutralize my energy, she said. So everything's fine. If you were as decisive and mischievous as I am, we'd explode from our energies right away. Then they started kissing until dawn, and then woke up in someone's apartment. They couldn't go to the campus, as guys and girls live separately there. There is, of course, a dormitory for married couples, but you need to get married for that, and then wait in line for a shed room. Otherwise, all students would get married in their first year. As a result, they constantly stayed overnight at friends' places. But they were insanely happy. Fred wanted to get a job to afford at least a room for the two of them. He even arranged to work at the crematorium near the morgue, somewhere on the outskirts of the city. What kind of doctor will you be if you sit in lectures during the day and burn corpses at night? You won't get enough sleep. And I need my husband to be a real doctor, maybe even a surgeon. Carolyn tried to dissuade him. After these words, Fred became even more amazed by Carolyn. After all, she saw him as her future husband. Lord, she practically proposed to him right now. What a wonderful girl. She's one in a million women. Fred was even afraid to think about the wedding. He was sure that Carolyn would only be with him while they were studying at medical school. And then she would find some professor or associate professor. But it turns out she has serious feelings for him. And she intends to turn him into a surgeon. What an amazing woman. Fred, I need to talk to you. She said, smiling cunningly. I'm listening. He said, leaning towards Carolyn and looked into her green eyes. Do you think my parents will allow me to have an abortion? We don't need a child right now. Don't worry. All the women in our family can easily get pregnant. We will definitely have a child. But just a little later, she suddenly fell silent and, without blinking, looked into his eyes. Fred couldn't see for himself what she saw there or how he looked from the outside upon hearing such news. But Carolyn stepped back from him and held out her hands as if intending to stop him from doing something. Okay, Fred, forget it. I understand. I will give birth. Carolyn said and approached him again. He hugged her tightly and held her close. That's right, he said. How can my child be unwanted? A child is always born at the right time. Only the Lord knows who and when will appear in this world. And if he decided so, then it's time for my child to appear. I understand you, Carolyn said. From that moment on, she became somewhat calm and serene. And Fred, on the contrary, ran between the dorms and lecture halls. He watched over her to make sure she wasn't hungry, wasn't cold, didn't carry heavy bags. Their friends even laughed at them. We didn't quite understand. Fred, which one of you is pregnant? They joked. I think it's me. Fred joked back. Carolyn was already in her eighth month of pregnancy when it was a cold autumn day outside. 
and suddenly her whole group at the university was awarded some vouchers for a trip far from the city. No. What nonsense. I don't understand. Fred protested. Let them fly wherever they want. Why do you need to go? Your belly is already very big. Exactly. Carolyn replied. The belly is already very big. And we still haven't gotten married. My parents have been pestering me with questions about our wedding. You understand. I was born into a strict family. And this shouldn't be happening. What can I do about it? We are waiting for a spot in the campus for a shed room. You yourself said that's what we need to do. And when it's our turn for a family room, we'll get married at the registry office right away. The wedding will come later. We'll celebrate in the summer. Fred justified. I'm not talking about that right now. Carolyn said. Offended. Think about my words. You are now forbidding me to fly on an excursion from the university. And who are you to me? A husband or maybe a father? I'm the father of your child. That should be enough for you. Take your passport and let's go to the registry office. They'll marry us there. What's the problem? With such a big belly, they'll marry us on the same day, even without the necessary documents. Why are you sitting there? Get up and let's go. Fred said angrily. Or do you not want to go to the registry office anymore? I want to go on this excursion. I won't have another opportunity like this. And if they decide to send me on another trip later, I won't be able to go because my child will already be born. Where can I go with a child? Carolyn said, holding back tears. What do you mean you'll have a child later? The child already exists. It's just inside you. Fred said, placing his hand on Carolyn's belly. Look how much it's kicking. It feels like it's going to be born right now. And you say it will be. But it already is. And it wants to go on this excursion too. When the child grows up, I'll show him these photos and tell him how he flew on an excursion with me. Carolyn said, Okay, go on the excursion. Fred said, waving his hand. It's useless to argue with a pregnant woman. If only he knew how many times he would regret those words later. Why did he say that? Why did he agree to this excursion on the day of departure? Fred was somehow very worried. He couldn't calm down and was worried about Carolyn. Maybe you'll stay and not go on the excursion. Fred asked one last time. You're starting again. You can become a crazy person like this. It feels like you're the pregnant one, not me. Fred, you're a future doctor. Learn to control your emotions. Pregnancy is not an illness, and flights on airplanes are considered the safest, as they have the lowest number of accidents in all transportation worldwide. Carolyn said confidently, as Fred returned to the campus, he couldn't stop thinking about Carolyn having to fly on some private plane. It felt somewhat precarious to him like flying in a toy plane. If he had known in advance that she would have to fly on such an unreliable aircraft, he would have insisted that Carolyn not fly anywhere. He was sure that the students would fly on a normal plane from a well-known airline. The man couldn't shake the thought that Carolyn deliberately didn't tell him about it. She knew that Fred wouldn't agree, so she kept silent until boarding. She understood that Fred wouldn't cause a scene at the airport in front of strangers. She knew him so well, yet he couldn't understand her. She was always a mystery to him. They agreed that Carolyn would call as soon as she landed and settled into the hotel. Fred watched some TV for a bit, but realized he didn't understand the essence of the movie. He scrolled through some news on his phone, tried to read something, but couldn't remember any information. He decided to just turn everything off and go to sleep. Oh, what about Carolyn? She's supposed to call me when she lands, Fred thought, turning up the volume on his phone and went to sleep, thinking, Carolyn's call will wake me up. Waking up, Fred quickly got out of bed, waking his roommate. What's wrong? The roommate asked. I don't know, Fred replied. He really didn't understand what was happening to him. It was as if his whole body had been struck by lightning in his sleep, and that's what woke him up. Fred looked at the clock. It was already six in the morning. Why hasn't Carolyn called yet? 
She was supposed to land six hours ago and check into the hotel five hours ago. What's going on? Maybe I didn't hear her call. Then where are the missed calls? Maybe there's no signal. Or is she so tired that she went straight to bed and forgot to call me? Carolyn usually wakes up quite early. I think she's already awake. Fred called Carolyn's number, but her phone went to voicemail. What could have happened? Fred thought. Lying down in bed and placing his phone next to him, he couldn't fall asleep anymore. And at 8 in the morning, his phone rang. Fred didn't sleep. He just lay there, staring at the wall in the room. The phone rang incessantly, but he couldn't bring himself to answer it. He simply didn't want to pick up the phone. He didn't look at the phone screen. He already understood everything. He somehow managed to determine what had happened by the nature and urgency of the call. He just felt it. And that was all. In the evening, their plane crashed somewhere in the northern part of the country. Search and rescue operations had already begun. Relatives needed to arrive at the airport by 10 in the morning. He knew it would be like this. Now, recalling how he didn't want to let his beloved girlfriend go, he realized that this was exactly what would happen. He felt it and feared it. He had allowed Carolyn and their unborn son to go there. The man understood that this was the end of his life. There would be no more happiness, no more joy. There would be nothing good at all. Why did he let them go? Why? Fred couldn't even remember how he managed to get to the airport. Many people gathered at the rescue headquarters. Many of them were crying. Stands with lists of passengers and crew of the plane stood in the corridor. But Carolyn was neither in the list of survivors nor in the list of deceased passengers. How is this possible? Fred asked. If she's not on the lists, it means she's missing. The staff told him. What do you mean missing? The plane crashed. Where could she have gone? Take a look around. Fred exclaimed. Young man, there's no need to panic. Missing means her body hasn't been found. Someone from the crowd said. It means you still have hope. Maybe they'll find her alive. You have to believe in that, you know. Miracles can always happen. What miracle could happen? Fred said, waving his hand. He spent over a day at the airport. Updates on found passengers came every hour. The list of deceased grew, and someone from the list of survivors moved to the list of deceased. Carolyn was still nowhere to be found. This is strange. Maybe she wasn't even on this plane. The man thought and dialed her phone number again. What if she answers now with her cheerful voice? But no, her phone was still off. Fred hadn't slept for almost three days. He couldn't think straight anymore. A friend of Fred's came to the airport. Since it was a university trip, there was another girl from Carolyn's group on this plane and a few more people from the university. They insisted that Fred go home to rest. They promised to stay there and call him as soon as they had any news, regardless of the time of day. Fred returned to the campus and lay down on his bed. He just lay there, staring at the wall. But he quickly fell asleep from the sleeping pill he had taken, seeing no dreams at all. A month after the plane crash, Fred didn't think about anything and didn't do anything. He even stopped going to the place where the plane crashed. Carolyn was the only passenger who was never found. The search team presumed that when the plane crashed, her body fell into the lake. But due to the low water temperature, the girl couldn't survive. And let's not forget, Carolyn didn't dive into the lake by herself. It was because of the plane crash. Back in town, Fred couldn't continue studying at the medical university. He just didn't want to continue. He was granted a leave of absence. And given the circumstances, they kept his place in the campus. He realized that he had to go on living somehow, but he didn't want to do anything. Later on, Fred remembered about the job at the crematorium, where he had wanted to work part-time before. It was nice for him to recall that place because it held memories of Carolyn. And Fred felt the urge to go back to work there, as it was associated with memories of the living Carolyn. Fred was immediately hired at the crematorium, as there was an open position. He started working day and night, as if possessed, as if he was working for Carolyn. 
for his future family. At this job, he could think of her as if she were still alive. One day, a gypsy woman came to the crematorium, looking very odd. Of course, they all looked a bit strange, but this woman was particularly peculiar. She was wrapped in various rags and covered with scarves. It was hard to tell if she was a woman or a man. Woman, why did you come here? Someone from the staff asked. Oh, I, I wanted to ask. Could I put a box there? The woman said, pointing to the incinerator. Oh, how you torment us with your boxes. A staff member said to her, another free cremation and then we'll get reprimanded by management. Such situations in the crematorium were not uncommon. All grandmas and grandpas, and now gypsies too, brought their boxes. And what was in the boxes? Sometimes a beloved dog that lived for 15 years, sometimes a cat, sometimes a parrot. Our parrot died, and if the child sees it, he'll cry. We told him it flew away. The woman said, some would give a dollar for cremation, some ten dollars. Well, what else could they do? People needed help somehow. Where would they put their deceased pets? Especially people often came in cold weather. The employees joked that they should open a separate branch. If elderly people offered at least a dollar for assistance, the gypsies would never pay anything. They thought everything should be done for them for free. And sometimes they even started arguing. The staff had long decided not to argue with them. Fred, as a new employee, was also told that it was better to agree with them and not to start quarrels. Otherwise there could be problems later. The management, of course, didn't welcome such illegal business. And they used to ignore it altogether. The main thing was that none of the staff abused it. And now they often received reprimands. Once. There was an interesting case when a little girl brought a turtle to the crematorium. Bury the turtle, the girl said through tears. Uncles, my turtle died, the girl said and handed over a few cents. The staff opened the box, and there indeed lay the turtle. Only it was very small, about the size of a palm. How old is it? The staff asked the child. I don't know. I got it for my birthday in the summer. The child replied, ah, the turtle really tucked itself all the way in, covered with its paws, and that's it, as cold as a stone. One worker, who did well in school, said, turtles sleep all winter, and they live for over a hundred years. Such a small turtle couldn't have died. The staff placed her closer to the furnace, where it was warm, and after ten minutes, she stuck her head out, and the gypsy woman asks to cremate her pet's box, but naturally for free. Fine, put the box in that corner. When we burn the deceased today, we'll put your box there too. Who do you have there? A cat, a dog, although it doesn't matter. So the box stood in the corner for almost half a day. No one touched it. By that time, Fred had already arrived at work and the staff immediately turned off the cheerful music, as everyone knew what sorrow had befallen the man. Hey, what's that squeaking? Or crying? Fred asked, and then everyone heard that from the box brought by the gypsy woman, a quiet cry was coming. Fred quickly grabbed the box, opened it, and was surprised because in this box lay a small living baby. He was very weak, so he cried quietly. Fred. As a former medical university student, immediately understood that the baby was born about a month ago. And what if his colleagues, listening to music, without looking in the box, put it in the furnace? Guys, where did this box come from? Fred asked. The gypsy brought it, wrapped in rags. We couldn't even see her face. His colleagues told him. Fred held the baby in his arms and looked at him carefully. And the more he looked at him, the more it seemed to him that he was going crazy. Fred, we need to do something with the baby. We need to call emergency services. His colleagues told him, guys, what are you saying? Look at him. This is my child, my son. Fred stubbornly insisted. Of course, all the employees thought he had gone mad. After all, Fred had lost his pregnant girlfriend, almost his wife 
and her body couldn't be found during the search operations. He didn't even have anyone to bury. Now it seemed to him that this was his child. Fred took out his phone and showed them photos of Carolyn. Everyone was shocked because such a coincidence couldn't be possible. The boy had red hair, just like his mother's. And the most important proof was that the child also had a mole on his cheek in the shape of a star. Such a coincidence couldn't be just accidental. How could the child end up in the city? Especially since Carolyn couldn't be found. And where is Carolyn herself? Fred constantly fought, like a madman. He searched for the gypsy woman all over the city, and finally found her. At first, he even thought that maybe she was Carolyn, since no one had seen her face. But the gypsy turned out to be another woman named Emily, and she hid her face because she was injured in a fire. Emily told Fred that other gypsies brought this child from somewhere in the northern part of the country and they gave him to her so she could ask for money on the streets from people. People would be more sympathetic if she had a child with her, so they would give her more money. But she didn't want such a child. After all, this child had too light skin, red hair, and a mole on his cheek. The gypsies believed that such a child could only bring misfortune to the family. And Emily, after standing with him on the street for a while, agreed with them because people stopped giving her money. So she decided that she needed to get rid of him. And how else could she get rid of a child? She couldn't think of any other way. So she brought the child to the crematorium. After the fire, Emily had problems with her head. And she believed that all problems could be solved with fire. The gypsy woman first thought that Fred would hit her for wanting to put his child in the furnace. But Fred got down on his knees in front of her and began to kiss her hands, thanking her for bringing this child to them. The man told her about his misfortune and that this was his child. The gypsy promised to pray for him and told him where they brought the boy from. Fred looked at the map and saw that this small town was not far from the crash site of the plane. Fred was obsessed with the idea of flying there and finding Carolyn. But first, he had to figure out what to do with the child. He couldn't leave him with himself. So Fred applied for adoption and did a DNA test because in court, as it turned out, moles were not considered evidence. This whole process took a lot of time and Fred couldn't wait. He took leave and went back to the plane crash site. Only now, he immediately decided to find the gypsies who brought the child to his city and find out from them where they found him. Fred was sure he could find Carolyn. The man arrived at the plane crash site quite late and decided to spend the night somewhere. The locals suggested that he go to the lake shore, where Carolyn presumably fell, and there lived a grandmother, who was either a healer or a fortune teller. He could ask her to spend the night in her house. Everyone is welcome there. Her name is Teresa. So Fred did. He went to Teresa, and she, upon seeing the child, immediately said, my child has returned. How could this happen? What do you mean, your child? Please tell me everything about this, Fred said. And who are you? And how did you come to me? Teresa asked. Fred entered the house, sat down on a chair, handed the child to the grandmother, and began to tell about himself, about Carolyn, and about his life. He talked about how they loved each other, how they wanted to get married, and how she flew on this excursion while pregnant. And then he told about the plane crash and how the gypsy brought the child to the crematorium for burning. Your life is complicated. Such sorrow to endure. You wouldn't wish it on anyone. And now listen to my story, said Teresa, laying the child on the bed. Teresa didn't know how that red-haired girl ended up in the lake. She either fell out of the plane or managed to jump. And the grandmother found her when she was fishing in a boat. Their lake was unusual. There were hot springs. And there were places where the water wasn't quite cold. So you could fish all year round. Especially if you had a boat. When Teresa was paddling in her boat, she noticed a woman in the water. She was beautiful, red-haired, unconscious, and pregnant. The grandmother took her to her house, and by evening, she learned that there was a plane crash nearby. Apparently, 
This girl was from there, but Teresa didn't have time to figure it out. She needed to take care of her. For about a month, she tried to bring her back to life and save the baby, and then labor began. The girl gave birth to the baby, but she couldn't regain consciousness. And about three days later, she died. What was the grandmother to do with the baby? She knew that there were gypsies in the small town. They had many young children, and she thought someone among them could breastfeed the baby. So the grandmother took the baby to the small town, gave him to the gypsy, and even paid money so that they would find a woman who could feed him. And she buried the girl. And when she returned to the small town to inquire about the baby, it turned out that they had already given him away somewhere. And they smiled at the grandmother with impudent eyes. What baby? The gypsies asked. There was no baby. Are you crazy, grandmother? And I was already thinking that maybe I got something wrong. And then you came with the baby. Teresa said joyfully, I want to see her. Fred said, see who? The grandmother didn't understand. I want to see Carolyn's grave. I want to realize that she's gone. I came here hoping to find her alive. I hope to find her in any condition, even without arms, without legs. It didn't matter to me. But apparently, it wasn't meant to be, Fred said. Yes, don't worry. Apparently, you and Carolyn had such a fate, said Teresa and hugged the guy like a mother. At least I know that the girl's name is Carolyn. And I also recognized this boy right away. He has red hair and a mole on his cheek. Just like his mom, Fred went to Carolyn's grave, stood there for some time, where now lay the love of his life. Then the man took a board from the grandmother and wrote all of Carolyn's details on it, laying it on the ground. I'll come back later and make a monument on the grave, he said, and don't rush to come back. You can make the monument later, said Teresa. So, now take care of the child. You're a father now. See what a gift the Lord has given you. Not everyone has such luck. Apparently, you're special people. What will you name the boy? I'll name him Alan, Fred said. A good name for a boy. We have a good church here. Can I be the godmother for the child? Teresa asked. Of course, you're like a real grandmother to him now. After the baptism, the man returned to town with the baby. And just then, the adoption papers were ready. The DNA test showed that the baby was indeed his. But now, how could he work and live on campus with a baby? Fred thought and decided to go back home to the small town where he came from after the army to attend medical school. He thought it would be easier for him to raise the child there. Fred's mom, upon seeing the little baby, immediately burst into tears. She wasn't personally acquainted with Carolyn, but Fred had told her everything over the phone. And now she saw her grandson and was able to hold him in her arms. How could she not cry? He looks so much like you. You also had big eyes as a child, but his hair is red, while yours is dark, said his mom. Of course, he looks like me. He's my son. After some time, Fred managed to find a job. In the boiler room, he did his usual work, except there was no need to burn bodies. He just had to shovel coal into the furnace. Do you want to go see your rose? His mom asked. She was asking about you. How was she asking? Doesn't she live here? Fred asked in surprise. And where else would she live? His mother said. She came back home two years ago, but she's married. Did she have a boy or a girl? Fred asked. Why don't you go see her yourself and find out? Why are you asking me? I've never been a gossip. His mom replied. It seems strange to me. Why should I go to her? Fred said. What's so strange about that? Your first love is unforgettable. Oh, sure, mom. As if that's my first love. My beloved woman is lying in the grave now. And my second love is sitting on your lap. It's all understandable, son. No one says you should forget about your life. Of course, you have to remember that. But you also have to live. You're still a young man. Just go. Talk to her. I'm sure you have things to talk about. Mom, 
what happened to her. You go and find out for yourself. His mother insisted. Fred thought and decided to visit Rose. Along the way, he picked some flowers from the flower bed. Feeling anxious about the upcoming meeting, why did she come back to the small town? It's clear she divorced her husband if she's asking about me. I wonder if she had a boy or a girl. Well, I already have a child now. Fred was very nervous. He kept thinking. What if she rejects him now? But why? She had left him herself. When he came back from the army, she was already pregnant with another man. Hello, Rose, Fred said softly, standing at her doorstep. Fred, what have I done? She said, embracing him tightly. He didn't expect such emotions from Rose. They sat down together, had tea, and talked for a long time. Fred told her the detailed story of his love and how he found his son. Oh, Fred, you were lucky. You had true love, and I had it all bad, Rose said sadly. My husband, whom I married because of the pregnancy, didn't want to marry me at all. He turned out to be an alcoholic and took me after the wedding to his hometown, where he constantly drank and beat me. And when I gave birth to a boy, he was constantly sick. And I worked to feed the family. I regretted that I chose not you, but this horrible person. But I couldn't change anything. And then coming back from work, I saw smoke. It turned out there was a fire in the house. My drunken husband started it. Everything burned down. The house, the property, the husband, and my son. I was saved from suicide twice. And then I thought, of course, it's a pity for my son. But what kind of life would he have? He was very sick. He would have suffered all his life. And now, he's with the Lord. These thoughts made me feel much better. And I decided to return home and start over. And then I found out that you came back here. And unable to resist, I asked about you from your mother. Forgive me, Fred, for what I did to you. The Lord punished me severely for this, Rose said, crying. You know, Rose, I probably did something wrong in life, too, because the Lord punished me, too. Although not as severely as you, at least he left me with a son alive, Fred said. You come to visit me with your son. I'll gladly play with him. I've heard that many people become angry after the death of their children and can't stand looking at other children. But I, on the contrary, really want to interact with children. I think I'll go work as a nanny in kindergarten in the fall, Rose said. That's good. Rose, that's good, Fred said. Two months after their meeting, Fred and Rose applied to the registry office, and a year later they had a daughter. Rose loved both the daughter and the boy with red hay equally. It seems that people find their happiness only after going through hardships.